says, but ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds in the sky and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all of these things does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. And this morning, I think it's safe to say that the snow is finally done. <laughs> and we see spring happening, and we see uh, resurrection life happening in creation. Uh, and we know that God's hand is at work, that he has created this, and that he is constantly sustaining his creation. Uh, so this morning, let's sing of that. This morning, with rejoice in all your works. It's the God who loves us, who has brought us here this morning, and it's the God who loves us, who greets us and says grace to you and peace from God our Father 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we've been greeted by God. Let's greet each other. Guide us, O oh God. Let you be our true vision. Let you be the word and the spirit. Be our true light for us, God. Remind us that it is in you and you alone that we are given true life. And may we celebrate and rejoice in your love. 
We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. As you're seated, the children uh, for the children's worship, they can come up and we're going to hear a song from them.
Good morning. Before we hear the word of God for us today, let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, come to us now. Fill our hearts and our minds with your presence so that we're overwhelmed with your goodness. Open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So, this morning we'll be exploring one of the most familiar passages, I think, in all of Scripture. I don't think it's too much of a leap to say that each and every one of you have heard this passage, 1 Corinthians 13, before. Um, if you've been a Christian your whole life, if, you've, if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, if you're a new Christian, in any case, you've heard 1 Corinthians 13. I'm, I'm sure of it. Uh, and because of that, I want to try a little bit of an experiment this morning. And it won't require much of you, don't worry. Um, it, all it is, is I, I want you to try and hear 1 Corinthians 13 as if you're hearing it for the first time. Throw away all those preconceived notions or all those ideas around what this text might be about and try to hear 1 Corinthians 13 for the first time. So, um, I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians 13 now. Try to hear it for the first time. This is the Word of God. And yet, I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'm not entirely sure that this passage needs a sermon. We could just all hear it a couple more times and walk out. But um, it's 11.22, so we'll, <laughs> we'll go. And I want to start by quickly situating ourselves in 1 Corinthians, in the book of 1 Corinthians, in the letter, really, of 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians 13 comes after 1 Corinthians 12, before 1 Corinthians 14. And um, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is in the middle of chastising uh, the Corinthians for misunderstanding the meaning of spiritual gifts, specifically the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. Because the Corinthians, they seem to think that uh, uh, spiritual gifts are given by God to individuals in order to make them more and more spiritual, right? So the Corinthians have kind of developed this hierarchy of what the sp good spiritual gifts are, and if you go up this ladder, move up this hierarchy, and eventually obtained, obtain speaking in tongues, then you've reached the summit. Then, really, you're a great Christian. So they've created this hierarchy, and in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's correcting them, and he's saying, actually, spiritual gifts are all about 
the unity of the church. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, we get that kind of famous metaphor that Paul uses. Uh, the church is one body made up of many parts. And we need all those parts to be the body of Christ, he says. So the idea that spiritual gifts can be used for like your own individual advancement or your own kind of sense of spiritual superiority, he says that's ridiculous. Spiritual gifts are for the unity of the church to bring each other together. So that's 1 Corinthians 12, and then comes 1 Corinthians 13, uh, which Paul introduces by saying, and now I will show you the most excellent way. And that excellent way is all about love, all about love. But because we've heard this passage in so many different contexts, I want to stop and ask, what kind of love is this in 1 Corinthians 13? Because if I'm not wrong, most commonly we hear it read at weddings. And so we might associate 1 Corinthians 13 with romantic love. And while it's never a bad thing if a relationship begins on a foundation of love, of 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love, I, I don't think that's all that's going on in the text. Um, so maybe we can explore it a little bit deeper, get to know the text a little bit more, and, and figure out what's going on. And, and to do that, I want to frame our time in the text with two questions. The first question is, what kind of love is this in 1 Corinthians 13? What kind of love is this? And then the second one is, how can we practice that kind of love today? Pretty easy, I think. Well, pretty simple. So first, what kind of love is this in 1 Corinthians 13? Uh, I, I want to start with 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, because that gives us a definition in and of itself. So it says, love is patient, love is kind. This is a kind of love that does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others. It's a kind of love that is not self-seeking, not easily angered, a kind of love that keeps no record of wrongs. It's love that does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It's love that always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So in a way, that's a definition of what kind of love this is. Uh, but we know from other parts of First and Second Corinthians that this, this kind of love, especially described in verses 4 through 7, is a kind of love that is rebuking the Corinthians for their behaviors. Because they, they've been boasting. They've been boasting about how spiritual they are. They've been seeking after the gifts for their own gain. They've been short one, with one another. They've built these barriers between the us and the them. Uh, they've put their own individual interests above the unity of the church, um, above the unity of the Christian community in Corinth. So in, in part, 1 Corinthians 13 is the, a kind of love that rebukes the actions of the Corinthians. And in a way, too, I'm sure, rebukes our actions, too. Um, but we'll get a little bit more to that in a second. Something I want to make exceedingly clear, though, is that this love is so, so, so much more than just a rebuke. Because the kind of love found in 1 Corinthians 13 is the kind of love that emulates and copies the love of Jesus Christ. This is Jesus' love. It's full bore, nonstop, self giving, Christ like love. Um, and this kind of love is only possible because of Jesus and his love for us and for all of creation. When Paul uses the word love in 1 Corinthians 13, he has, it seems, a specific image in mind. And that image is the image of Jesus Christ on the cross. So it's the kind of love talked about in John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Or it's the kind of love that's described in Philippians 2. A love that did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. A kind of love that humbles itself, 
by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Or it's the kind of love that's talked about in maybe another one of the most famous passages of Scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So really, really, at its core, this is Jesus' love. It's a love like no other, and it's a love that fills and upholds the universe. Something that's pretty incredible. Um, the Greek word that's used for love in all of 1 Corinthians 13 is agape. And you might have heard this word before. You might have also heard uh, a sermon or someone teach on the three different kinds, the three different words, Greek words translated as love in the New Testament. Not going to get into all of that, but I want to look at, focus on this agape thing. Because in like ancient Greek literature, before the New Testament was written, the word agape is hardly ever used. Like, it's very rare. And when it's used, it's never once used as a noun. So like in this passage in 1 Corinthians 13, you see love is patient, love is kind. Agape is patient, agape is kind. It's never once used before the New Testament in that sense. And then comes the New Testament. And in the New Testament, agape is used for love 105 times, much more than any of the t than, than we can find it previously. 105 times. And it's almost as if the followers of Jesus needed a whole new word. M not a brand new word, but basically a new word, a new meaning for the kind of love that they were experiencing and seeing in Jesus each and every day. It's pretty remarkable. They couldn't find a word in their vocabulary that matched the kind of love in Jesus, so they were like, agape. That's the kind of love that is found in 1 Corinthians 13. It's a love that is so self-giving, so unselfish, so poured out for people who are completely unworthy of it. And it's this kind of love that Paul says is the most, that God says, is the most excellent way. Um, but it's the kind of love that doesn't seem to be guiding, like I said earlier, the actions of the Corinthians. Because instead of building one another up in love, they're, they're jostling for power and position in their community. Uh, rather than striving for unity, they're aiming for like individual recognition or spiritual superiority. And here's the thing, I don't, I'm going to guess, but I don't think that speaking in tongues is a big controversy in this church. Maybe it is. You can correct me afterward. And maybe we don't create this hierarchy based on spiritual gifts and speaking in tongues. But I'm sure that in this church and in the church in West Michigan, in the church in the United States, we have our own ways of playing the who's a good Christian and who's not game. We have our own ways of creating that hierarchy. We're, we're still uh, self-seeking and judgmental. We still grapple to get ourselves to the top, to pursue our own wants and needs instead of pursuing the wants and the needs of our brothers and our sisters in the faith and, and those people in our neighborhoods and around us in our communities. So, I think we've answered our first question in a way. What kind of love is this? This is the love of God in Jesus Christ. And it's full bore, it's all out, it's agape love, it's all encompassing. It's transformative, uh, self-giving love. And I think that gives us a base so we can, we can try to answer the second question then. How can we practice this kind of love today? And normally, in reading and interpreting and understanding and studying the Bible, I think that's a tough question. What does this say to me today, now, in the day-to-day -day of my life? And it's still a tough question here, but I think there's a pretty clear answer. And it's this. To love with a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love today means to love one another in a way that builds up 
and edifies the body of Christ. I'll say it one more time. To love with a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love today means to love one another in a way that builds up and edifies the body of Christ. Now, that's a bit of Christianese. We don't typically use edifies in our daily lives, so I want to break it down a little bit. I want to do that this way. In our culture, in our society, we're in the midst of a season of polarization. So often it feels like we have to take sides, right? It's one side or the other. And it feels so much that way that even the words I'm about to say carry so much weight in them, carry so much context, so many connotations that they're just heavy. But I think it's true, so I'm going to do it. In the United States today, it's either Republican or Democrat. Baby boomer or millennial. Faith or science. Christian or non-Christian. And if it's not that way, those are the voices that we're hearing the loudest. You have to decide, pick one or the other. But 1 Corinthians 13 pretty clearly, I think, uh, calls us to unity. And that doesn't mean that we have to agree in every single little thing. Quite the opposite, actually. I think if we disagree and are unified, even in the midst of our disagreement, that is a more powerful form of unity than if we just agree on everything. But, but 1 Corinthians 13 does call us to the kind of unity that transcends, that goes beyond one side or the other. That goes beyond being right or wrong. That goes beyond winning or losing. Because being in Christ means Christians have a greater call than one side or the other. Christians are, uni are not united by the candidate that they support or the country that they live in or the generation they might belong to. But Christians are united by the love of God in Jesus Christ. And the shared confession that Jesus uh, is Lord. And the shared confession that our world belongs to God, that Jesus is Lord of all creation. That's what we're unified by. I think a clear, a, a crystal clear image for this is found in the Gospels, and it's the first few, dis the first disciples of Jesus. Right? Because in one corner, you've got fishermen from Galilee. Probably very poor, probably very uneducated. Uh, in another corner, you've got uh, zealots. And zealots were Jews who were angry, angry at the system. Angry especially at the Roman Empire. And zealots were so angry that they often committed acts of violence. A lot of the time against the Roman Empire. If we were to use like modern lingo to describe zealots, we could probably call them terrorists. And then you've got somebody like Matthew, a Jew who was a tax collector, collecting taxes for the Roman Empire, a Jew in collaboration with the Romans. There is not a single person on the planet that a zealot would have hated more than a tax collector, a Jewish tax collector working with the Roman Empire. And yet, yeah, all, all these groups, fishermen, uh, zealots, Matthew, the tax, tax collector, and everybody else following Jesus, were not defined, were not identified by that. Instead, they were defined, identified by the love that they were experiencing in Jesus, this man that they were following. They were brought together and unified by the love that they shared in Christ. Uh, and I'm sure their differences didn't fall away. Like, we have plenty of evidence of that in the Gospels. They argue constantly. And probably they argued even more than we, than we see or hear. But those differences definitely took a back seat to their identity as followers of Jesus. 
And a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love implores us, insists that we love one another in a way that builds up the body of Christ. So we can, we can fill our sanctuaries on, on Sunday mornings. We can have the most incredible worship experiences. We can even go out into our communities and start the best programs to help all sorts of people. But, but none of it will be worth a single anything, 1 Corinthians 13 says, if we don't love one another in Christ Jesus, because it's love that holds it all together. And there was a book that was published in 2007, and it's called Unchristian. UN Christian. Unchristian. It was actually written by two Christians, uh, two sociologists that, that took teams of people and went out across all of the United States and Canada and interviewed thousands and thousands of people. And one of the questions they asked, or in, well, let me say this first, the, the interviews of these people, uh, the people they interviewed ranged from uh, hadn't heard of Jesus or Christianity, or had but were completely against Christianity, all the way to people who had been committed Christians their entire lives. And as part of the inter these interviews, they asked the question, what is the number one descriptor of Christians, would you say? What would you say would be the number one adjective that we could use to describe Christians? And number one was hypocritical. Number two was judgmental. Number three, I uh, can never remember, but it's bad. It's really bad. It's not good. Like, the top six are bad. <laughs> so to so many people, to non-Christians, to committed Christians, to even to committed Christians, Christians don't practice what they preach. But here's the thing. I think, imagine if as a body of Christ-worshipping people, we loved one another in a way that pursued unity. What if we, we disagree with one another on things, but we still come to the table together, we still worship together, we still pray together, read the Bible together, care for each other? What if, what if Christian communities, instead of so often appearing hypocritical or judgmental or fragmented, came together and said, look, we might disagree on some things, and we might disagree strongly on some things, but we share in the love of Jesus Christ, and that's a stronger bond than anything else. That's what holds us together. What if we had, um, like, really contentious conversations and talked about difficult subjects in public? Not like just in the grocery store, but if we held conversations here and invited anybody to come, and people saw, wow, these people disagree on things, and yet they love each other. They're still unified. I think that would offer an incredible alternative to this dog-eat-dog, -dog, right or wrong, one side or the other world. And it would change our witness. Instead of people seeing Christians and saying hypocritical, judgmental, people would see Christians and see Jesus. Because we all know we don't need any more hypocrites. The world doesn't need more hypocrites or more judgmental people. The world needs more Jesus. The world needs the love of Jesus and the grace of Jesus. But it's not easy to love people with a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. Because we're, we fall short. We can't muster up the strength on our own to 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 love each other in this way, or to love the people in our communities this way. So I, I want to end with, with this. It is something that um, a pastor I know says to finish a lot of sermons. It's this. In the economy of God, each and every one of you is worth Jesus to God. Each and every one of you is worth Jesus to God.
That means that when God looked at a world overcome by sin and us embroiled in that sin and imagined it without us, he couldn't bear it. So God became flesh in Jesus Christ who lived and served and died and was risen for you and for me. And that, that is 1 Corinthians 13 love. That's the kind of love that inspired, that the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of, of, of the New Testament to, to find a new word for. And that's the kind of love that through the Spirit we can experience. And we can love each other in the world in a similar way, despite our messed up and sinful selves. So what, what kind of love is this in 1 Corinthians 13? It's the love of God in Jesus Christ, and it is the most powerful form of love that you could ever imagine. And how do we live it out? We experience that love, and then we love each other in the ways that we can, and we stay unified in the midst of all that, too. Let's pray. Lord God, your love is patient. Your love is kind. Your love doesn't envy or boast or is not proud. Your love does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking or easily angered. Your love keeps no record of wrong. Your love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Your love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Your love is amazing, and we thank you for it, Lord. We pray um, your Spirit's presence among us, that we might experience and know your love, Lord, and then live it out. Live it out in a way that shows that um, we're united, we're unified in, in the love that you, that you give us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God is love, and it is in him alone that we find our identity, in that love. So let's stand together and sing of his marvelous love for us. I stand amazed.
so before we receive God's tithes and our offerings, will you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, we confess that this whole world belongs to you. We confess that we belong to you in body and in soul. And, and Lord, um, we offer ourselves to you as offerings. Offerings to do your will in this world. So Lord, we can't do that, though, without you. We can't do that without your love. So as we prayed earlier, send your spirit on us that we might experience and know tangibly in every part of our being that you love us. And Lord, then, then bless the things we do, uh, including this morning as we give our offerings to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before we sing and before we go, would you stand to receive God's blessing? Friends, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and the unity of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us. Amen.